Hello, this is another one of my videos on Alistair Parker's book, The Second World War, uh, this one dealing with the economy of the Soviet Union. This is the third section of a very long chapter on economies at war. The Soviet Union's fighting strength was based on an economy far stronger than anyone else had realised, including the Germans. In 1941, the Soviet Union was thrown into crisis with the German invasion, and Stalin rejected the military most effective strategy of defence, that is, allowing much of European Russia to be overthrown, overrun, sorry, overrun by the Germans, so as to keep Soviet forces intact for eventual counterattacks when German supply lines became overextended, as of course the Russians had done in response to Napoleon. To have followed that strategy would have placed the economic riches of Western Russia within temptingly easy access to the Germans, however, and apparent acceptance of defeat might also have destroyed confidence, uh, popular confidence in the regime. But Stalin's strategy of forward defence led to worse disasters. By November 1941, the Germans had inflicted massive military defeats on the Soviets, as well as seizing over half of the entire Soviet productive capacity in coal and steel, and over one third of its grain producing land. By that time, the Soviets had lost three times as many aircraft uh, and over two times as many tanks as their industry could produce. By 1942, however, the Soviets had both stopped the German conquest of Europe and their factories were making war we more weapons and munitions than before the invasion had begun. As the Germans had advanced in 1941-1942, Soviet machines and workers had moved east beyond the Volga River and often beyond the Ural Mountains. This was not an industrial evacuation strategy planned in advance by the government, as it didn't fit in with their strategy of forward defence. Rather, most managers simply improvised, as indeed did the central government after the invasion. Some managers quietly made their own plans also. Already before the war, government economic planners had expanded basic industry in the East. By 1940, about one third of Soviet coal and steel uh, production came from the East. But it was only after the invasion that the bulk of Soviet arms production did. Before the invasion, the armed services received less than one fifth of their weapons from the East. But by 1942, this had increased to about three quarters one and a half million truckloads of industrial equipment was moved east. This might often be confused as when workers lost their equipment and never caught up, but it could also be very successful as with the tank works from Kharkov, which left at the last minute in October 1941, but resumed production of T-34 tanks on the 8th of December from a site beyond the Urals. Overall, 1,523 factories went east, with about one-third of their original workers. Although armament production increased, total industrial production fell, so that civilian consumption abruptly contracted. In 1942, civilians obtained 40% less than in 1940, a particularly severe cut given that Soviets consumed much less than Westerners pre-war. Food production collapsed in the areas not occupied by the Germans. Meat and fat production was reduced by about one half of the 1940 figure. Grain production to about one third. Those who didn't have priority suffered from hunger and starvation. In order to get more food, the government increased the number of labour days on collective farms from 254 to 252 days per annum, reducing the number of free days per year, thereby from 111 to 13. Absenteeism 
was punished by re-education. Women bore the brunt of these policies. By 1943, three quarters of the able-bodied population on collective farms was female. In the machine tractor stations, the heart of the collective system, women replaced men, the skilled men inducted into the armed forces. By 1940, one out of 25 tractor drivers was a woman. By 1942, almost half were. There was a partial reversal of the state's farming policy of the 1930s. Then the state had relied on coercion and close supervision to force the collectivised peasantry to produce food at prices fixed by the government so that the growing industrial workforce could be fed. Now, while the state demanded even more from the peasants, it also offered new incentives, permitting them to sell what they could produce on their own personal plots at whatever price they could get. Sometimes these were as much as 30 times the official procurement price. Town dwellers also eagerly cultivated home-grown vegetables in their plots of land. Like agriculture, industry absorbed more women workers. Already before the war, 41% of industrial workers were women, but now that rose to 52%, including in skilled jobs in the expanding war industries. Between 1941 and 1943, training courses produced 13 million newly skilled industrial workers. The state was able to direct workers to take up work anywhere. It also offered incentives to increase productivity, including peace rates, bonuses and extra food rations for those who exceeded the production norms. Communist Party members played a major directing role. The hectic modernisation of the 1930s had produced a small educated minority, which now led the unskilled, unschooled and uncomprehending uncompre majority under the banner of the party. They acted as an elite marshalling the rest of the people. Ambitious and active men, their interests were linked to those of the regime. They were accustomed to high-handed leadership, backed by powerful sanctions. Along with the development of basic industrial capacity east of the Urals, they played a key role in the de decisive victory secured by the Soviet economy, which halted the German advance. The Soviet Union held the German attack in 1941 by its own efforts. Thereafter, Allied aid, particularly from the United States, played a crucial role providing supplies that were equal to about one-tenth of Soviet production. This included much of its food and most of its mobility. This included almost three million tonnes of high-quality steel, over half a million tonnes of non-ferrous metal, four million tonnes of food, 385,000 trucks and 51,000 jeeps from the United States. So that ends the section on the Soviet Union. Thank you very much for listening, and particular thanks to my patrons, without whom I wouldn't be able to make these videos. If you want to support my channel, you're very welcome to do so. Please do like, comment and share on the videos, if you will. Subscribe if you want to be notified of future videos. I'll give Patreon and PayPal links below if you want to provide practical support. Next week, we'll look at the economy of Britain uh, during the war. Have a good day.